to our panel this morning on Combat Cloud, the third offset strategy. The United States military is now at an inflection point where the speed of information advances in stealth, precision strike, next generation sensors, and other technologies will permit us to move beyond the combined arms warfare construct of segregated land, air, sea, and space operations. Now this shift is not gonna come easy as we're moving from an era of industrial age warfare with its established concepts and precepts and ideas into an era of informationalized warfare that is very much different. At the same time this technology-driven shift is occurring, we're also at a juncture where resource availability is becoming constraining in terms of the ability to achieve the mass that had previously characterized the American way of war, but no more. Combined with both these realities is the growing realization that desired effects should be the real driver of modes of engagement in lieu of industrial age approaches that wage wars of occupation and attrition. No more. The potential result is a new joint operational concept for achieving a combat cloud, a concept that integrates the functions of ISR, precision strike, maneuver, and sustainment to achieve desired effects across all domains. In other words, the third offset strategy that you heard the Secretary just speak about that's sought by DOD leadership may not be based solely on new wonder weapons, but rather by building a combat cloud that optimizes and leverages the systems that we have today and are already programmed for tomorrow. How could we do that? By building a system of systems architecture to achieve a synergy of operations through the ubiquitous sharing of information, and in doing so, providing us with a dramatic competitive advantage relative to future adversaries. Now, our panel members today are gonna to address the potential of this combat cloud concept from a variety of different perspectives. So to get us started, let me give you some brief introductions, uh, and then we'll have them ha give you some of their perspectives for a short period of time, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers to discuss this exciting and new concept. Retired four-star General Gary North is currently the Vice President, Customer Requirements, Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company. General North was a former commander of Pacific Air Forces and has held multiple command positions in peace and war. Gary is also a National Director of the Air Force Association. Jim Hazeltine has been working at DARPA for over 10 years, supporting the design, testing, and integration of various advanced data links on aircraft, electronic warfare pods, remotely piloted aircraft, and weapons. He's also worked with new software applications during these tests to help enable the tactical end of this combat cloud architecture. Heather Penny is Director, Air Force Air Superiority Systems at Lockheed Martin's Washington office. She currently flies with the DC Air National Guard, was a combat mission ready F-16 pilot from 2000 to 2009, one of the few people who ever flew combat air patrol missions over our nation's capital on 9-11. She's also the co-founder and director of the DC Air Power Working Group. Dave Ferencrew is a strategic planner in Northrop Grumman's Analysis Center, and he's also a professor at Georgetown University. He recently retired from the Air Force and his last assignment was in the Office of Net Assessment where he did a comparative analysis of U.S. and Chinese approaches to information warfare. Dave's been instrumental in crafting the findings of the Mitchell Institute working groups on the combat cloud. And Dave's gonna start our discussion this morning. So Dave, over to you. Thank you, General Deptula. And uh, my thanks to the Mitchell Institute for including me in this uh, discussion on the combat cloud. It uh, really has been a, a love-hate relationship in going through this topic. A love because exactly what uh, General Deptula laid out, that th with the right concepts, the capabilities that the United States Air Force and the United States military have been fielding for decades now could actually result in the offset strategy that 
that the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work, has put forth. The hate part is that uh, institutionally and bureaucratically, new concepts are hard to put in place. And so while some of the, the things that we're talking about today have been around for decades, and other concepts have been put forth to describe how to use these capabilities, we've had a hard time institutionally accepting them and change from industrial age to a information age uh, military has been challenging. And so I thought I would provide some overarching perspectives on, on the changes that are occurring in warfare. Uh, there is probably a fundamental question running around the audience right now about well, what is the combat cloud? And uh, I felt bad that a lot of the other presentations have had these really nice uh, slides and showing the, all their stuff they're doing. And, and we had talked about, we could put our picture up there, you know, of a cloud with the lightning bolts coming out and touching all the airplanes. That's the combat cloud. It's generally not very helpful in talking about what you want to do with that combat cloud. So I'm going to sort of break the problem down into, into two areas. So when we talk about the combat cloud, there, is, there are two ways to, to dis discuss it or, and describe it. One is physically. So what are the components that actually go into a combat cloud architecture, this information systems architecture? I'm not going to talk about that because uh, Heather and, and Jim are going to do a better job at describing some of that. Instead, I'm going to talk about the other piece, and that is what do you do or what happens in a combat cloud? So I'm going to talk about the combat cloud from a functional perspective. And to do that, I'm going to walk us back about 154 years to a time during the Civil War when the Confederate Army was fielding an elite group of signalmen who rode with the cavalry. And the primary purpose of this group was to seek out the Union telegraph stations. When they got to those telegraph stations, their job was to send false messages, uh, block messages, and when they had thought they had disrupted Union communication sufficiently, they then dismantled the whole unit, took as much copper as they could, and then left. It's sort of the precursor to what we will then do for the next 150 years and still do today, and that is to go after information and information systems. If you fast forward to World War I, you see the development of, of radio, and the navies quickly adopt radio as a way to, to uh, coordinate fleet maneuvers. They also realize that the mere communications results in a ability to locate other ships. And so the direction finding capability off of a radio frequency becomes a key ability to locate and plot where the enemy forces are. And you see an immediate competition between navies over how they use this new communication, how they control their information. Move forward again to World War II, and that radio now has advanced into radar. And radar provides a way for us to detect and not soon after, we figured out a way to send false information back to that radar using radio. That competition continues even more with the development of the computer. We can now do advanced computations on information in a way that hasn't been able to do before. If we advance even further and go into Desert Storm, you see on display an information capability that the world has never seen before. Not only is the U.S. military able to connect its forces together and share information in a way that hasn't really been done, but they're also going after explicit information systems with the Iraqis. And they literally paralyze the Iraqi army. They disrupt their communications, they disrupt their sensors, they disrupt their integrated air defenses, because the United States recognizes the need to disrupt information. Information became an advantage on the battlefield. It always has. But the systems we have today allow us to access that information in a, in a way we've never been able to do before. And we're also able to do things with that information that we've never been able to do before. If you get to today, you can see that we've, we've just continued to proliferate those, those information systems. We have access to data that we've never had access to before. We can manipulate data in a way that we've never been able to manipulate data before. Every one of us in this room with a smartphone can ask a question and have an answer almost instantaneously. And that's a battlefield environment we're going into in the future. And at the end of Desert Storm, we had adversaries who were watching extremely closely about what we did. It was a wake-up moment. The United States' advantage in Desert Storm came from information systems. And so the Chinese in particular are very eager to disrupt our informational capabilities. For them, they described it as informationized warfare that is, mechanized systems that now have information systems on them. 
and they realize that the key to getting an advantage against the United States is to disrupt our access to information. So the combat cloud comes as a way to describe what the battle space looks like. The battle space is a battle for information. It's, it's something we haven't fully considered or embraced because we're used to being able to get it and then go after it. We understand it sort of intuitively, but we haven't organized ourselves around the concept that the key engagements are going to be over who's controlling information, who's controlling information systems. It's such that no matter what the outcome, no matter what type of conflict, that the key is going to be who's better equipped, who's better organized to control, to, to protect, and then to attack information and information systems. And honestly, if, if we're going to be serious as the U.S. military and an Air Force about this particular change in, in warfare, then we're going to have to change our doctrinal concepts the way we're organized, the way we're trained, and the way we're equipped in order to win this battle for information. With that, I will turn it over to Heather. Thank you, Driver. And it really is a, an honor to be included on this panel with such distinguished speakers. Uh, so uh, Dr. Farnkrug talked uh, about the battle space and for contested information. And I think that that's somewhat intuitive as we're moving forward, but uh, it's important to note that it's the advantage in warfare will go not just to those who control information, it's about who, uh, who will be able to exploit the information that they control. So I'd like to take his conversation a little bit further into the tactical realm, uh, because information intelligence does many things, but for the tactical application, it's fundamentally about facilitating your targeting solutions. So we're no longer in a world of fixed targets. Dynamic and fleeting targets compress and challenge our targeting cycle, first for detection, and then for pairing the platform and weapon set that's best suited to prosecute that target. Can it get there in time? That's a major question for us today. So Combat Cloud will compress our targeting cycle well within those fleeting moments of enemy vulnerability. In the past 15 years, we've responded to the dynamic nature of the battle space primarily with long duration orbits of remotely piloted aircraft. But with Combat Cloud, loiter time is not what provides that persistence. It's a saturation of the airspace with many sensors from different platforms and from different axes. Individual platforms may come and go, but the area is always covered. And because it's covered by more platforms and sensors, that target intelligence will be faster and far more rich. Likewise, we've already begun to decouple the integral weapon platform, the kill chain, if you will. Instead of a single entity completing the kill chain, many platforms will collaborate together as a system to prosecute those target sets. Similar to a JFAC sending coordinates to a JDAM or an aircraft buddy lazing another aircraft's bomb, Combat Cloud will further mature this trend and take these tactical vignettes, which decouple the kill chain to make it more effective, it'll take these vignettes and move them to the operational level at the theater, uh, at the theater level. So I'd like to note that the flexibility and rapid operations facilitated by Combat Cloud will actually change our ATO process and also cause us to reassess how we've approached rules of engagement. First, the ATO will move away from pairing aircraft and ordnance loads to specific targets, and it'll become more about creating an optimally configured ecosystem of weapons and platforms. We'll also see a shift away from uh, the rules of engagement being KOC may I or general counsel may I. We've been very permissively oriented asking for that permission of who's going to buy the bomb uh, in how we wage war. But if we're to exploit the speed of operations that the combat cloud enables, we'll have to develop rules of engagement that empower our airmen, and then we'll need to trust in their training and professionalism to do their jobs. Coordinating this dynamic environment will require a renaissance in the air battle management career field. Dynamic does not mean chaotic, and air battle managers will be the key to effectively matchmaking within this ecosystem to assemble the kill chain. This will be one of the more challenging aspects of operations within the combat cloud. Dynamic operations cannot devolve into an anarchic free-for-all, yet we will fail miserably if we model the ABM operator relationship after the Soviet-style close control GCI. We need to find the right balance and develop tactics and doctrine that will cover the range of fully permissive through, excuse me, through contested spectrum operations. 
And air battle man managers will also be important because they will be the nodes that link air operations to the different domains. Space and cyber will be the first domains that we will actively and dynamically sync with to provide a range of effects options to the joint force commander. And air battle managers will be the gateways to connecting targets and the desired effects within those different domains. So I'd like to end my thoughts uh, with a, excuse me, I'd like to end my comments with a few thoughts on gateways. I may be a little counterculture here, but I believe that gateways are a fact of life and they're here to stay. Existing gateways are too important to current operations, and frankly, they have a utility and programmatic momentum. These data links have been optimized for their particular platform and need, and that's okay because not all data links are created equally. You can't send full motion video over a data link that's designed for PPLI. Waveforms, message sets, bandwidth, and spectrum, they should be and need to be designed for specific purposes in order to be efficient and effective. These numerous networks create resiliency through graceful degradation. If one network is disabled, it doesn't cripple the entire operation. Numerous specialized data links across a large frequency spectrum are also good because they complicate the adversary's problem set and imposes cost upon them. When we think about future gateways uh, and the data that they will move, they'll need to do more than just translate. They'll need to also transliterate data between the different types of data links. For example, we will need gateways that can extract and pass target data from uh, things like synthetic aperture radar or full motion video across more conventional data links, like Link 16 or MATL. And in passing the information, gateways will also be gatekeepers. Because they will process data from a number of entities and networks, they will be our first warning of network intrusion. They'll be able to identify uh, that intrusion, that hacking, that spoofing, um, and they'll uh, be able to find that com compromised node, isolate it, and hopefully rehabilitate the broader combat cloud to enable continued operations within the A2AD battle space. So in conclusion, a lot of this discussion about combat cloud informationized warfare, it sounds very intuitive. It's like the network of things and network of uh, internet of, of things and internet of weapons. But I think we're just at the leading edge of where evolution becomes revolution. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the chance to be here to help AFA. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit differently this morning and talk a little bit about the actual data links and some of the software. How can we create and actually acquire this combat cloud so that we can help our Air Force fly, fight, and win over the next few years? We, we need to purchase a bunch of new hardware. We need the new advanced IP or internet protocol data links, utilize those new waveforms, and create a bunch of new software that goes over them. This has been talked about for years, and it would be kind of the holy grail if we can actually tie all these airborne networks, our terrestrial networks, and our space networks together to create that concept of the gig or the global information grid that we've all talked about to try to get to network-centric warfare. That would be the goal. We have a bunch of various fielded data links now that we've used over the years, and we've tested a bunch of large amount of new advanced IP data links and the software applications that go over them. We've tested these in a bunch of different exercises from JEFXs and, and other DARPA and AFRL events. Today we fly a lot of data links like Link 16 and Saddle, and these are all based on 70s and 80s technologies, which are kind of like our fax machine. We need to work to get this and our warfighter to another level. Uh, with the current wars and the explosion of all the modern ISR capabilities that we have today and the SATCOM systems, these things have really expanded in our RPA world uh, and on the big ISR aircraft that do have modern IP SATCOM communications technologies, and that has really allowed places like the KOC and our Intel centers to share this data and collaborate in real time or near real time, and we need to keep expanding on that. Places like our offices, our command centers, and those special mission aircraft have these capabilities. It's really helped us in the war, and how can we spread that? We really need to work to tie in and proliferate those capabilities into our tactical platforms and as well to our ground personnel, like the soft forces and our JTACs, so that we can really complete and get that network to everybody and get the net out there. Today, as we sit here, as we've talked about, we have PDAs, cell phones, laptops, 
all these various communications technologies that have really changed the way we operate. We can collaborate in many different ways. We have all kinds of applications on them that we can do all kinds of things from find your restaurant you want to go to tonight or navigate to your next meeting. Our airmen use all these capabilities and live with it every day. But an analogy to use is our guys go step into an F-16, the canopy closes for our mission, and that data input almost ceases. We need to find a way to help that transition to get the advanced capabilities to our warfighters. Part of this is a hardware solution with the radios and the computers that drive these new data links. Then once we get the new data link, there's going to need to be a whole revolution in the applications that we can run over these advanced systems to help our forces collaborate. Similar, that, that's similar to what has happened in our world in the last 15 to 20 years with the internet, the explosion of the 3G and 4G systems with things like our iPhone and Android devices. If we can field that capability, it's going to be a great leap in capabilities for our forces. That kind of brings us to the technology maturization. Things like our Link 16, it's taken us 25 plus years to field that, and we're still continuing to put that in our aircraft today. We've got to help speed up that transition to the warfighter. You look at things like our modern technology on the civil side, we just came out with the iPhone 6, and that took them six months to a year to put that out. How can we help do that for our forces? This, is gonna, this software arena is going to be a huge growth arena for our services, our research labs, and our industry for the years to come. There are some challenges that come with that. Uh, there's, we have a, a, a whole lot of our legacy systems that we currently have. These different systems have certain capabilities, and that brings in the challenges of gateways. As you mentioned, we're going to be living with those for a long time because those legacy systems that we have, we just can't throw those away. So how can we effectively fight with those? Uh, in fielding these new systems, we're going to need a lot of new crypto, uh, crypto solutions and then NSA certification for these hardwares, which is, which is not easy or cheap. Uh, we got to work with DISA and on information assurance to certify all these new softwares that we can use. So a big challenge for us, I think, right now is how can we focus on this force multiplying capability in this challenging financial time? We need to figure out a plan to acquire this new hardware and software capability and maintain the tactical edge over our adversaries. And how can we do this in a timely manner? This is why they put me last. You know, it's really interesting. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, Dave. Thanks very much. Thanks for what the Missile Institute does and uh, for AFA uh, for sponsoring uh, this every year. Uh, I started as a third generation guy flying airplanes. So I went out when Dave asked me to sit on the panel and I said, I want to pulse a couple folks. Uh, so I pulsed the third generation guys uh, and they go, look, one peak in our lives was worth a thousand sweeps and third generation guys don't fly in clouds. I pulsed fourth generation folks and I'm one of those. And uh, in fourth generation folks, just like, just like James said, you know, you close the canopy, it's almost a helmet fire uh, because your fusion is inside your cockpit uh, and it's your hands and your brain and maybe your four ship and now Link 16. Uh, and, and fourth generation guys jump in the cloud because they don't want to see stuff that's getting shot at them. So I went out and I pulsed fifth generation men and women and they gave me the answer and they said, look, the combat cloud is all about fusion. And these are the men and women that in our Air Force today and in, in the nations of the world that are going to fly fifth generation platforms and deal in fifth generation fusion, they get it. Just like we've evolved with links and what have you, it takes a long time to bring excellence to maturity. And so the definition of requirements is very important. And then the industry piece to jump on it, to bring it to the warfighter is important. I spent the last six and a half years in uniform uh, in both the, the Middle East and the Pacific as a CFAC and a JFAC. And my most important weapon, as we all know, is information. Good information is good, no information is bad, and if you get bad information, it's probably because you don't have your architecture right, or the enemy has been shooting arrows at you and they're confusing you. 
So what is really important here is, and we've heard this from every speaker almost in every panel, is the most important part of our business is to have a good defense so we can be on the offense when we're directed. And that ability of information assurance is absolutely critical uh, across the spectrum from tactical to strategic. And so when you look at this, this is what fusion is. The fusion engine is how you integrate, and we saw the picture yesterday of the bug. So how do we take sensors into an evolution that can be automated and ensure that the command and control authorities, all the way down from a, from a JTAC on the ground, all the way up to the combatant commander, and at every chain has the same site picture, and understands the same focus and in integration and fusion of data, turning that data to information, that information to knowledge, and then making it actionable. And so what does the combat cloud do? What does this management of information uh, do? It's got to have the right hooks, and that will allow a architecture that can be one, self-healing, two, very defensible, and three, the ability to maneuver in the speed of battle space, which is absolutely critical. It will enable decision makers at every level to be able to execute warfare, either kinetic or non-kinetic, uh, at whatever target needs to be executed. It will build resiliency to enable that capability. And probably the smartest person in this evolution when it gets down to war fighting is the young man or young woman normally a staff or a tech sergeant who is working as a JICO, Joint Interface Control Officer, to ensure that that information flows at the right level. All the way from the forward edge of the battle, uh, you know, ideally fifth generation platforms out there not only being kinetic but, but taking information just like the F-22 has been doing uh, over Syria, uh, to where now there's not a package that doesn't go without a fifth generation asset out there working and being able to, one, deliver when required, but sense and infuse and data back into the network. So that's the resiliency that allows the complexity piece to go, and it really is an expansion of the network, uh, and, and that expansion will enable warfighters to make great decisions. It's the interoperability, which to me is the third offset. Fusion is really the, a key part of the third offset because that offset is how we do things in an environment with our coalition partners. Because as you've heard from all the speakers, we can't do this alone. We'll never be able to do it alone. We've got to build coalitions. And in building that coalition, you've got to have interoperability. To me, that's the framework. And I think about this as a four-legged stool. I try to keep it as simple as possible. And that first leg of the stool is your sovereign national capability because every nation has got to have capability, but then the second leg is interoperability. And that interoperability is a multi-level event, as we all know, and that gets into the policy pieces of it, which is the third leg of the stool. The fourth leg of the stool, of course, is how industry can respond appropriately to finite requirements, uh, leverage, so that, as we just heard Dr. LaPlante speak, industry can provide solutions to the warfighter very rapidly. And that, that's really important. Uh, we've gone revolutionary, evolutionary, innovation. We don't even know yet how to bring the proper amount of fusion into a combat cloud, but we're gonna learn quickly, and we have to. We've gotta defend it. We've gotta make sure that when people are trying to penetrate it, take our data, or confuse us, that we can see it and understand it. I was on an exercise years ago, uh, and in this exercise, we had a red team jumping in, and their goal was to confuse, obviously, the blue force. They did pretty good, and we learned from it. In this exercise, we were working from multiple locations, and so uh, our red team jumped in and uh, played with our cop, the common operating picture and the confusion in the command and control structure because we were looking at what we thought were the same things differently uh, really confused us. So we've got to protect our net first and we've got to understand what's common. I think uh, we talk about the CAOC a lot. To me, the CAOC Combined Air Operations Center uh, is evolving rapidly. It needs to be, like every command and control system, 
that you can transport the data into that around the world and you can bounce it faster than one the enemy can see and you can bounce it fast enough so that every warfighter has got the right capability at the right time. Another way to think about the CAOC is a common, assured, operational capability. And that's what we must have going into the future. Fusing that data so that warfighters at every level have the capability and the capacity to do what they need to do uh, anytime, anywhere, to the foot in a second, kinetic or non-kinetic. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, panelists, for those uh, insights. Uh, now let's hear what the uh, audience is uh, thinking about. Um, General North, you talked about fusion. Obviously, if there was any one-word summary of what the combat cloud was all about, that's uh, a great candidate word. The other one, however, uh, I can imagine as being sharing because as you alluded to and others on the panel, uh, Combat Cloud is gonna have to include our allies and our partners. Um, Heather, you mentioned that gateways uh, uh, will also be gatekeepers. Uh, so in considering the multi-level security aspects of including all our friends and allies, can multi-level security algorithms act in conjunction with the gateways to solve this challenge in a seamless and automatic fashion? Anybody on the panel? James. <laughs> yeah. Seems like the smartest guy in the room yeah. on that. <laughs> I guess I can say something on that. Uh, that is a challenge. Uh, a lot of the new data links are being built to handle the mills uh, kind of capabilities. And the advent of the gateways, all of these things, it's another complexity that's added in there. Uh, we have demonstrated them, and I think there's a lot of potential for those down the road. A lot of our systems right now don't do as much of that. Uh, but some of the new waveforms, things with like the new jitters, radios, they're really working at uh, addressing several of those things. This was talked a little bit about yesterday when it came to command and control, but I, th I think technical solutions exist uh, right now. A lot of it has to do with how we're tagging the data. So how the, how the data is actually organized and with the meta tagging that goes over that data. Then it becomes a question of just policy. So what are we comfortable doing when it comes to uh, trusting the systems that are going to automatically screen out the data and allow us to transfer between on these gate gateways? Uh, so it, I think technical solutions are available right now. And if we were uh, interested in pursuing them aggressively, I think we could make a lot of progress. It's going to take policy decisions in order to make and release that information to, uh, especially when we're talking about multi-level classifications. Uh, among among allies. Okay. Uh, here's another one for anyone on the panel. I haven't heard much about contested environment operations. What about cyber attacks on centralized servers, electronic warfare attacks on comm links, EMP attacks on everything? Okay, I take a hack. Um, one of the uh, sort of the struggles we have now with our current architectures is their incredibly static nature. So we have built networks that uh, use the same IP address for decades. We've been using the same waveforms among our data links for, for decades. Uh, we uh, are putting our systems so that they're only one of a kind or there's unique, there's not multiple pathways. In other words, we're not taking advantage of what the actual characteristic of a network is, and that is multi-path, multi-nodal. And so the, the better we become at distributing our networks, actually capitalizing on what defines a network, uh, where we are using multiple waveforms, we're using uh, multiple data centers, uh, we're using uh, multiple gateways, uh, you create a um, a surface area that becomes very difficult to go after. And it, the more agile we are when it comes to operating systems, data locations, uh, even applications. And all these solutions exist today uh, where you can move applications across OSs, so you don't have to stay on the same OS, not even at this, on the same day or the same moment. That we can create a, a much more agile and what I would call a, a maneuver network so if the adversary is trying to go after you and target you, then you're basically taking on a maneuver element within your network environment. 
I think that's one way to get after some of those traditional uh, electronic warfare or even um, using software to go after your systems. And I'd like to, to build a little bit on that. And we talked a little bit about the resiliency of having a number of different networks. Not only do you have the opportunity to, as we develop more advanced networks that are, exist in different areas of the spectrum and have different characteristics, uh, having multiple types of links on each platform does help provide that type of resiliency in the real-time battle space. Uh, additionally, gateways will be gatekeepers and we'll be able to really isolate the compromised nodes uh, that are allowing that type of uh, hacking attack, if you will, come in. But we really need to be able to operate uh, within uh, an environment which I think will be imperfect at best. We will become immobilized in terms of our ability to manage and transmit information if we continue to have policies that demand that our networks are fortresses. So we need to understand that one of the values that the Combat Cloud does is because there are so many different nodes, so many different center, uh, 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 sensors, that what we're really looking for are truth trends. So uh, if you have a number of different sensors that have the same, that agree, are in agreement regarding particular pieces of data or information, that we can assign that a type of truth trending, and that other sensors or nodes that are di in disagreement, uh, there needs to be uh, a filtration of that type of disagreement and perhaps flag that as disingenuous or, or incorrect data and that's where we can begin to look where intrusion uh, may be occurring. But part of this is a policy question. Again, if we're looking for our networks and for all of our uh, data links to be uh, absolutely impervious and, and fortress-like, we're going to be com uh, completely immobilized and that will be a, really a self-imposition. We will, we, we will prevent ourselves from being able to take advantage of the maneuver space within the network that, uh, that drivers talked about. I think this is one of the huge challenges that we have today as we've, we talk about building these networks, using the different networks, and then especially even with the size of our Air Force, uh, do we have enough assets to do this? Uh, on the technology side, I think this is one of the things we're really working hard at to be able to have, we, we want to field these data links and have this cloud to be able to do it, but then there's also the vulnerability of having that capability and our adversaries and our peers, how they can exploit that or hurt us in that way in this whole new EWEA spectrum and what you can do these days. It's a, it's a huge challenge for us to be able to field that capability so that we can use it effectively. And I think over the next few years as we're really trying to field these new capabilities, especially on the fifth gen platforms and whatever comes next with this third offset, that maintaining these new data links is gonna be a huge strategy because as we are now learning to fight in this collaborative environment like we do in our own home uh, with our computers, we want to fight that way. How are we going to keep that in the new environment is the big challenge. I'll just wrap this up. There's probably a junior ROTC cadet out there in the audience who could give us a great answer on how they're going to, one, get inside the OODA loop of the enemy, how they're going to be able to detect, defer, deter, and defeat. And, you know, thank God we've got 24th Air Force and the young men and women that are out there doing this every day. The integration uh, inside all of our uh, people who defend the network and watch what's going on and then do the truth trends. And then how that enables, uh, you know, work to be able to get into the proper fusion of the penetrations and then to be able to kick them out and give warfighters the, the capability of knowing when they've got assured capacity or when things are degraded enough so they make proper decisions. Because we all know that the asymmetric capability of some of our adversaries is very, very strong. We see that around the world every day. Uh, and we know that they want to use that asymmetric capability to embarrass and, and defeat us. And we certainly can't allow that to happen. So uh, as we work with this, we've just got to drive to refine the engines to ensure the training is right and then it gets properly resourced and the requirements are enabled to be able to make stronger tools. Okay, well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, you have some great questions here. We're at the end of our time, but I would encourage you uh, to grab our panelists. Uh, afterwards, we're to break and uh, get your question answered. So to wrap this up, I would like to highlight that for almost 10 months now, 
the Mitchell Institute in conjunction with some of the Air Force's leading edge thinkers and doers on this uh, topic of the combat cloud from the Air Staff, MAGCOMs, DARPA, along with industry think tanks and academic representatives have participated in several workshops on how to define a way ahead for the kinds of things that you heard the panelists talk about. Their findings are being uh, wrapped up in a white paper that is going to be released shortly within the next month, and it will establish the underlying rationale for the cross-domain synergy that is achievable by focusing on the combat cloud as America's third offset strategy. That being the complementary, vice merely additive employment of capabilities in different domains such that each enhances the effectiveness and compensates for the vulnerability.